Now let's discuss how we measure developmental change in motor development research. The research in motor development is concerned with differences or changes in movement due to age-related factors. We are not concerned with movement differences due to variability in performance. For example, if a person misses a free throw shot or chokes during a game, maybe shoots two under par on a particular golf course, or is playing poorly against a tough opponent. We are also not concerned with movement differences due to measurement error. For example, if the scores are variable from one day to the next because my radar gun was not calibrated correctly, or measurements were not taken precisely the same way each time, or I missed the actual day that a person acquired a skill or a milestone occurred because it happened in between testing sessions. This is an example graph of age-related changes. In this case, changes in height in centimeters across the ages of about 10 and a half to 16 years. Age is along the x-axis. The dependent measure, in this case, height in centimeters, is along the y-axis. The dots represent measurement points for an individual. The curved line is the estimated or fitted change across age for this individual. The vertical dotted lines indicate different phases of puberty. For example, B2 and B5 represent different phases of breast development. P3 to P5 represents another aspect of pubertal development, namely the development of pubic hair. These two indicators, along with menstruation or menarche, are defining features of female pubertal development. What we see here is that there is a steep change in height between these different stages of pubertal development. After P5 and B5, when puberty is considered complete, the growth in height levels off. There are also a few other things to note. First, many, many measurements are needed to carefully estimate change over time during this rapid period of development. Let's say that the red dots represent the only data that was collected. With only a few measurements, we may imprecisely estimate when a particular change occurs, or we might miss a change entirely. Second, another individual may show a very different pattern of development. Here I show a second person in green. The green person starts off at age 10 and a half and is shorter than the person in blue. However, the person in green has a much more dramatic increase in height from ages 11 and a half to 14. In addition, the person in green ends up a bit taller than the person in blue. In addition to her change in height across age being different than the person in blue, the person in green also has different timing of the various pubertal milestones, and they happen at different ages compared with the person in blue. Third, age is only a proxy for development, and sometimes if we only consider age, we over or underestimate the developmental stage for a particular person. For example, if we are interested in how height changes as a function of puberty, and particularly the age of menarche, if we only looked at age 13, the person in blue would not have yet reached menarche or is less developed, while the person in orange would have already reached menarche or is more developed. So often in research, we collect many different types of data to help us understand why a particular measurement changes the way it does. In this case, we measure different stages of breast and pubic hair development, as well as the age of menarche, in addition to age at each time point. So far, we have only plotted or pictured developmental changes in one or a couple of people. But this isn't exactly research. Most research studies go a bit beyond just plotting one type of developmental change or characterize more than one person at a time. For example, in single subject studies, we might characterize individual constraints, study changes in time due to an intervention, for example, and then examine the behavior in a new context or environment. For example, I might teach a child to ride a bike and then test the bike riding skills indoors, outdoors on a smooth path, or outdoors on a variable surface like a trail. In contrast, in group design studies, we are interested in characterizing a group measuring that group's movement characteristics, and then describing differences between different subsets of people. For example, I could study sex differences in throwing velocity in young and older children. 
In longitudinal design studies, we are interested in measuring an individual or groups of individuals across multiple times. These are data from a study by Branta and colleagues in which 90 boys and 80 girls were tested longitudinally from ages 5 to 10, and then a second group of 75 males and 65 females were tested longitudinally at ages 8 to 14. What we notice is that there is a positive trend for both males and females with very little differences between the sexes in the younger children and a growing sex difference in the older children. We can conclude, because the data are collected from the same individuals across time, that the mean vertical jump height changes with age across childhood and early adolescence. In cross-sectional design studies, we are interested in measuring individuals or groups at different ages or periods of interest. Here are some fake data based on the Branta study, in which groups of individuals are measured once based on their age. We can see that there are differences in the vertical jump height across the three groups. However, since these data were not collected from the same individuals across time, we can only conclude that there is an age-related difference in vertical jump height between children, adolescents, and adults. We do not observe change because we did not follow the same individuals over time. We can only infer change based on the differences across these three groups. In mixed longitudinal or sequential research designs, we are interested in following different groups at different ages with some overlap. Let's return to the Branta study. There is one additional thing to point out here. Notice the difference between the two sets of individuals studied. One group began testing at age five and the other began testing at age eight. Each of these groups can be called a cohort. The term cohort refers to a group of individuals that share some characteristics. In this case, children that all started the study at age five and children that all started the study at age eight. What is interesting is that if we look at age eight, we notice that the children that started testing at age five have a greater vertical jump height than the children that started the study at age eight. This could be due to several different factors. First, the group that started at age 5 has already done this task three times, whereas the group that started at age 8 has never performed this task before. This could be considered a practice effect. Second, beyond practice effects, there may be a real reason why the cohort that started at age 5 was better than the cohort at age 8. For example, maybe jumping was no longer included in the PE curriculum for the older cohort. So this group did not have the same level of experience as the group that started at age five. Let's summarize the different research designs. Remember that longitudinal designs measure change across time in one individual or groups of individuals. So for example, we would follow group A at ages five, 10, and 15 years. In cross-sectional design studies, we measure different groups of individuals at one time. In this case, we could compare group A at age 5 and group B at age 10 in 2005. Or we could compare group A at age 10 and group B at age 15 in 2010. In cross-sequential designs, we compare different cohorts. For example, we could study group A at age 10 in 2010 and compare them with group B at age 10 in 2005. Before we complete our discussion of research designs and developmental studies, it's important to provide some guidelines to determine if a study is actually developmental. In 1988, Marianne Roberson proposed the following questions to help us determine if a study is developmental. First, the study must be interested in what the behavior is currently and why it is that way. For example, what are the factors or constraints that influence that behavior? Second, the study must be interested in what the behavior was like before the current observation and why. Lastly, the study must be interested in how the current behavior is going to change in the future and why. In order for a study to be truly developmental, all three of these questions must be answered or at least discussed. Okay, let's summarize what you've learned so far in this first lecture. First, we learned that developmental change is a lifespan process that is age-related, sequential, cumulative, multifactorial, and individual. Motor development is one window into understanding developmental change. Second, 
individual environmental and task constraints interact to produce particular behavior at a particular time in an individual's life. Lastly, developmental research is interested in the past, present, and future behaviors and why those behaviors are the way they are.